Okay. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Ending the Stigma, A Path to Recovery. I am your host, Fred Carroll, and along with my co-host, life coach and author of the new book, The Opio Opioid Epidemic, now available <laughs> on Amazon, Scott H. Silverman. How are you, Scott? Good, Fred. That's not an easy title. I got to tell you, it's like the word recidivism. You know, you, you've got to say it a thousand times before it rolls off your lips. Well, yeah. it would be easier. It would be easier if I spelt opioid right, because I spelt it opioid. I forgot the I. So when my eyes see it and I'm just glancing over at the opening, I, I say opi, opi, op, opioid. But it is opi and epi is very difficult to say. So by the way, an job. epidemic an epidemic actually is harder to spell sometimes than the uh, the other, but that's okay. But I'm doing well, you know, having a, a pretty busy week and uh, trying to uh, see what I can do to help save lives. How about you? How's your week been? My week's been going. It's still doing the job search and it's looking better and better every day, but we'll see. We'll learn more about it soon. Um, so let me let me ask you a direct question. Did you put me down as a personal reference or no? No, you know, I, <laughs> whatever's on my resume is, but believe me, doing a show like the ending the stigma is on my resume. Okay. I put it on my resume. No, but I meant my, my name specifically as a personal reference. No, I haven't, but I would mention it because anybody that has, you know, the clout like you have and stuff. It, it's always good, but it, I recommend people out there, if you're doing work like Scott and I are doing, like a show like Ending the Stigma, put it on your resume. Be proud of it. Go and let the world know that you do some good things that are trying to help others, and it can only move you further. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't tell them about Within the Head of Fred, but I'll tell them about Ending the Stigma. I don't want to go backwards. Yeah, because I, I have a whole list of prepared comments I'm prepared to give a potential employer on your behalf. By the way, speaking of your behalf and employers, years ago, you know, when I was working with a very difficult population, we used to call it people with um, um, unusual gaps in their employment. Um, and one of the things that we highly recommend, and I still do today, is if you want to get involved with volunteering and something you're passionate about when you work for a charitable organization or a community-based organization or even you know faith-based organizations when you're a volunteer you get access to the board of directors the executive director you know all the influencers of a company and what's really cool about that that's a great way if you're seeking uh, an employment opportunity in some particular area of specialty that might be, you know, very competitively uh, people are interviewing for or hard to find jobs. They don't come around very often unless somebody retires. Uh, working as a volunteer and putting that kind of thing down, like you just said on your resume, is really helpful because, you know, well, most, most of the big, um, you know, resume screening um, algorithms, if you don't have certain keywords, you're never going to get to an interview. But having that kind of thing down below in certain companies and even researching companies for example, in your area and go on their website and they'll usually tell you what their areas of interest are, whether it's the environment or, you know, cleanup or the ocean or, um, you know, anything from recycling to helping young people and using those buzzwords in the interview, it's a, it could be a game changer. Yeah, definitely. I don't see it hurting me in any way. And it is something I spend a lot of time promoting and doing. It could only help. So I wanted to mention to you, let's talk about homelessness real quick because you're, you're involved in that. It doesn't have to be real quick. We, we have no agenda here. Um, so we have, like about 11, we have like 11 minutes to make our point. If we can't make right. our point, we'll just roll it into next week. <laughs> so I read an article that, of course, homelessness is rising, as we already knew. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. So a California politician... I don't know. I don't have his name. I, I always forget you're in California, so I should get their name. And maybe you know who I'm talking about. But so a California politician believes each and every homeless person 
needs to be forcibly admitted for addiction and or mental health evaluation. Do you agree or disagree? Well, you know, it's interesting because actually a local politician, just uh, the previous mayor just said something to that effect actually yesterday um, here in San Diego. But here, here's what I know. I know I, evidence-based studies have shown the data proves that the percentage of self-medication, whether it's through prescription medication, <clears throat> self-medicating, street drugs, uh, addiction, and mental health issues um, completely embrace about 80% of the homeless population. So to your question, you know, it's always interesting, you know, how, what do you do? And let's use, for example, they call them re repeat offenders or the recidivators or what, what we used to call in the emergency rooms, the frequent flyers. People who would be going into the hospital who had been living on the street, you know, and when you're living outdoors and, you know, you, you, you lack the nutritional balance and you don't have a roof over your head, and you're sleeping outdoors and you're with other people, when you get to the hospital, you're pretty sick and that's expensive. Uh, and if you don't have insurance, the community somehow is absorbing that cost. So can you make somebody go do something they don't want to do? I'm not sure that's the best way to approach it. But what I would do is I would be a lot more aggressive and I would really, you know, one on one get involved uh, if, I, if that was my area of, of specialty like it used to be and, and, and really be insistent that an individual get help, you know, and recommend that they get assessed and make it easy for them to do that. So you have to incentivize it. I'll give you an example. There's a there's a term. It's called the housing first model. And it's been a big national conversation now for probably close to, I don't know, five or seven years. And housing first, to me, what I understand means if you're homeless, we're going to put you in a house. We're going to put you in a dwelling of some sort, an apartment, a hotel with a voucher, whatever it might be. Now, that sounds like a great idea. But if somebody doesn't have the life skills and if somebody's suffering from you know any kind of behavioral health issue or some substance use disorder, you put them in a hotel or a apartment by themselves, and they isolate. There's a There was a study recently done, I want to say Denver, Colorado, I'm not positive, might have been Utah, one of the two states, where they did that. And what happened was the person who was removed from a street environment where they were with other people, even the other people might have been inebriated as they were, they did not do as well alone, because part of survivability, even though it might be hostile, is working together or being together. So yesterday, our prior mayor, Kevin Faulkner, who, and I, and I thought it was fascinating the way he just came out and said, look, the housing first idea is great, but if we don't look at treatment first, we're going to have a real problem and we're going to see the recidivation it going on and on and on and on. And it just happened. I think you and I talked about this a few weeks ago in Oceanside, northern part of our community. All the county people came in, law enforcement, swooped up a bunch of homeless people, put them into a hotel and said, hey, we're going to let you live inside for 28 days as long as you follow all these rules. And we're going to help you with jobs and we're going to help you, you know, get some new clothes and we're going to feed you and you're going to have your head on a pillow. Well, <laughs> they didn't give them any notice. OK, so all of a sudden, all these people were disenfranchised from their homes on the street. Yes, it wasn't a good place to be, maybe, but it was their home. Now they're living in this hotel, no skills, nobody around to help guide them through the 24-hour lifestyle that one needs, you know, to be in a structured environment with rules. And then the next day, the homeless advocates, you know, were upset because the city came in and put big boulders, rocks, where the homeless encampment used to be. So the homeless advocates threw the rocks over the ravine, if you will, to get them out of the way. So, and, and after two weeks, half the people that were put in there left because they just didn't want to, they didn't want the structure. Then there wasn't really people there, for lack of a better word, holding their hand, giving them guidance, showing them life skills, and really comprehensively case managing. But what I've learned as a treatment provider and a guy in recovery, Fred, if somebody is under the influence of something mood altering, there really is no easy way to deal with the mental health issues. You can't. You cannot penetrate that anesthesia. So the treatment side of it, getting stable, stabilizing, getting into recovery and having all the wraparound services is what to me works. And I know because I experienced it with the program for three years that I 
you know, was on the board with, and I ran a program for 18 years and I saw it work. Meaning if you can't hold someone's hand through the process. So coming back to your original question, this is a long answer. Mandating that people get into treatment, in my opinion, is not going to bode well with the community. But on the other hand, if somebody is sitting there with a knife and they're threatening to hurt themselves or others, we have to intervene on that kind of behavior. And unfortunately, what's happened over the years is if law enforcement gets involved and their lives are threatened, they ha they'd have to do what they have to do and what they're trained for. So I think we certainly need a better way to do what it is we keep talking about, and that is to how do we reduce recidivism. So I think I have some good ideas. People don't even want to talk to me about it. And I, our personal, personally, I've been trying to reach the mayor, and he doesn't want to hear about it. And they're getting ready to throw a lot more money at putting people into housing and, and putting people on the street to talk to homeless people. And we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I hope right. it, it does better. You know, in San Diego, homelessness is up 40%. Yeah. And the prices are so it's expensive to live in San Diego, correct? For the most part. It, it, it give you an example. The, the home prices are up 20% from a year ago. Right. Yeah. It's, and and it, we're only, and we're only at, you know, June of, of 2021. So that, that is unbelievable. And after summer, we could be up another 15%. This could be a 35% increased year of appreciation, which is awesome if you own a home, but if you're trying to buy a home, and you've been out of work, you're going to have to wait a year or two to, you know, kind of cycle back up again. And homes could be up another 40%, they say, in the next two years. So good and news rent, again if you own a home. Renting is expensive, too. You know, being a renter is more expensive in some terms. I mean, sure. I know a ton of people who pay more in rent than friends who pay in mortgage. But Correct. then you, But you have to have the security. It's not always the smart move. I'm a renter. I'm a renter and it's smart for me. I've owned several houses, but I sold them all and I'm a renter now. And it makes more sense because my level of savings, I don't have enough savings to be a homeowner at this point. In other words, when the heater system blows, all that stuff, I wouldn't have that extra money. I could afford a home. I can't afford to maintain a home. So there is a lot that goes into it. So basically the homeless problem is still a problem that isn't going away your recommendation would be let's seek mental health or substance abuse help before we move make that the first step you know get them better in a mental capacity or addiction capacity and then deal with the clothing the jobs the how to live how to survive and all that right well and if you're the if you put together the right kind of packaging, if you will, with the providers of, of those services, you can do a couple things simultaneously. I mean, you can put somebody inside, you can tell them to get a couple nights rest. You can say, you know, we'll be back to see you on, you know, Sunday and we're, we're gonna sit down with you and we wanna go through what your interests are, you know, and build the relationship, build the trust. And when the trust happens, you know, you sit a couple days later, say, you know what, we'd like to get you over the doctor. Let's have some blood work done. Let's get you a, a physical and, and find out how your body, mind and soul is doing. I mean, most people, if you deliver that the right way, why wouldn't they take advantage of it? Unless they're feeling like someone's trying to, you know, do a workaround, if you will. So I, who doesn't want that kind of support? But when you're thrown into a hotel and you go, okay, here's your voucher, you get a month. Okay, what does that even mean to somebody who's been out on the street for two, three, four, five years or even more? And if they're suffering from, you know, long-term untreated trauma, they don't get it. They're not going to understand it. They don't know how to cope. Right. So right. we have to understand our customer, if you will, or the person we're dealing with. And, you know, you can't just have a one-prong approach. You know, like I talk about in my book, The Three-Legged Stool you know, when you're working with people who suffer from substance use disorders, you can't just approach it from one perspective and expect the other two thirds to fall into place. Right. So when I was young, when I was growing up, probably preteen, you know, 11, 12, I had a friend whose grandfather lived with him. And of course, I didn't know back then we're approaching early 80s at this point. I didn't understand mental health or any or addiction issues, all that stuff. I was just a kid, but his grandfather chose to be homeless in the summer months. He would disappear for three, four months and then come back for the winter. Now Ooh. I'm assuming that's a mental health issue at that point. 
he was he claimed he liked living on the streets. You know, that was yeah. I think so that's it was probably a mental it was probably a mental health issue. I just didn't recognize it, of course, as a young child. It could have been a facade for something else as well, because most people don't really you know, not many people like living on the streets. It's uh it's pretty uncomfortable most of the time. I mean, obviously yeah, yeah. when the weather's nice, it's easier, but other parts of the country, I mean Minnesota, you know, Chicago, your part of town, um, Washington, when it, you know, winters get to, you know, five, 10 degrees above, you can't survive on the street. You got to keep moving, go to subways, find places to hide out during the, you know, the, the day. I mean, I remember when I went to Minnesota once on a trip and I, as a homeless provider, I was there ho being hosted by another agency, learning what they do. I walked around for a day and I was talking to some homeless. I said, how do you survive? They go, well, during the day, we're in the sun. And we sleep whenever we can. And at night, we keep moving around. Otherwise, we freeze to death. I mean, it was that that was that simple is how they explained it to me. I believe yeah. it. It's, I can't imagine it. And I feel bad for anybody. I actually heard somebody. Where did I hear it? Somebody today. Oh, in the meeting I was in. He mentioned that every time he sees a, somebody that's begging for money or panhandling, he always gives them a dollar. You know, and he doesn't give them a dollar necessarily for them. He does it for himself, he said, because otherwise that guy rents space in my brain for the next couple hours. And mm -hmm. I can't have that because then I'm just sitting there going, I wonder if he's OK. I wonder what, you know, why he's there. So he says for his own sanity, he always gives them money no matter what the issue is. And that's for him. I don't know if that's selfish or anything, I but I think it's OK. I think it's a. It sounds like a good thing for his mental health. Yeah. I, 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 if anybody ever asked me about the money issue, I always said never give money. If somebody's hungry, buy them a meal. If, if you don't want to buy them a meal, get them a gift certificate, you know, at a fast food restaurant, uh, get them a, you know, a gift certificate at a Walmart. But giving, giving somebody who's living on the street money, probably 95% of the time that money goes to buy something that is going to be mood altering. But on the, on the other hand, if I was living on the street, I'm sure I would be under the influence as well, just to be able to survive. Yeah. So moving from that subject into Major League Baseball, I was reading an article about CC <laughs> Sabathia. CC Sabathia, the great pitcher from the New York Yankees, the team I hate the most, has written a book discussing the culture of alcohol use in Major League Baseball. And he says... Just for an instance, he says, you know that you have a problem and you need to get help right now. And what made him realize it was, according to him, of course, was he spent a night, 15, when, whenever this was that he's been sober now, I think six years, seven years, he could not stop drinking. He actually needed even though his brain told him you can't have one more drink, he still found himself at that bar getting another drink and he knew he couldn't control it then. But he says, you know, it's all good, but things happen in life. And as you get older, the alcohol dependency can turn into something bad. So get some help now. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up to you is his story claims that he, he took his first drink at 14 after a family death, I believe a grandfather that he was close to. It was weeks after his cousin had been murdered and his parents had just split up the marriage. So he takes his first drink of alcohol and he says, alcohol absolutely erased all those pains. He never thought of any of that when he was drinking. So he just continued. He just, from 14, he started. Now, he's a very, he was drafted by he was a basketball player, but he, he just played the game. But he said once he was in the big leagues, it became a culture. And that was the difference. And the culture was nobody cared if CC Sabathia was in a bar on a Thursday night the day before a game. As long as he did his job on the field, nobody cared what he was doing. You know, it, it, it's almost like it was part of it. Then he says, go right to the celebrations. The first thing they do is throw alcohol on each other. They're shooting champagne off everywhere. It's part of the culture. 
But you had did it. You did an interview on your other podcast. What's the name of your other podcast, Scott? Or- uh, Scott H. Silverman's Happy Hour. So you Happy can go hour. find that. That's on Apple, correct? Should be. Yep. Yep. Go go look for it on Apple. I'll put a link up to it there. But you had Brett Boone, who I assume had a similar issue. He was a former major leaguer. His brother is Aaron Boone, head coach, manager at the New York Yankees. Does this sound similar to his story that he told? You know, yes, in the sense of, you know, you're sitting in this culture, you know, you're flying around and and, and the jet of the the, during the season, of course. And, you know, you you have different priorities in the offseason that you do in the season. But, you know, you, you think about it. Young people come in, they get these great contracts. I mean, the the NFL's got the same kind of issues. And they, I think in some cases they kind of sweep it under the rug uh, a lot of times. But, you know, you're, you're under a lot of stress. You're under a lot of pressure. And as, and as you said, as long as you're performing on the field, as long as you're performing on the field, basically no one's going to give you a hard time about it. The difficulty is today when, when people act out or, you know, you go out to a bar, you get behind the wheel of a car, you know, you, you uh, run into things. You're impaired. And, you know, cocaine was a huge issue, I understand, in Major League Baseball. And what I also heard was Major League Baseball n- never used to test for cocaine. They did for steroids, but not for cocaine. So that was a big drug of choice for a lot of different people. And some people, you know, from what I've heard from some of the you know professionals I've interviewed, is the off seasons when they really, you know, when it really got uh, out of hand, and during the season, a lot of them would just kind of abstain because they wanted to keep their numbers up and they wanted to make sure that, you know, the, the coach was happy and that they were keeping their, you know, their income going and their lifestyle going. But, you know, when you're traveling around half the year and you're staying in hotels and you get bored or you're on different time zones, I would think the temptation's really high. Plus, you've got yeah. unlimited expense account. And, and as one of those you know, popular people, people want to bring you out, take you out and do nice things for you, buy you dinner and all the other things that go along with that lifestyle. Well, it wasn't only that either. He also said because of he being noticeable and famous, he tended to spend a loan time drinking. Next thing you know, you're just watching TV and drinking, hitting the bar in the, in your hotel room, the little nips and stuff. Right. But he said, you know, he mentioned a lot of things about it and he's not, damning baseball for it but he wants to make baseball aware so they could see this quicker because he he said he was lucky because some teams wouldn't have allowed him you know one when on the day that he stopped drinking when he hit that bender and that was his rock bottom the playoffs were starting the next day and he was the yankees star pitcher and he chose to go to rehab rather than the playoffs and the yankees granted him that some teams would have told them just pitch, you know, they would have made the sport bigger. So it's as much as I hate to give the Yankees any credit at all for anything at all in my life. I really do despise the Yankees a lot. Clearly. Yeah. It's trauma. It's traumatizing. They traumatized me as a child. Yeah. And and by the way, you know, I've heard stories about the, you know, the NFL that, you know, if I, I interviewed, you know, um, is it Aaron Brown? Aaron Brown? I believe his name was. And we, we talked about it as well. And he said, look, it, the, they, they just, they don't want to talk about it. And, you know, it's like most companies look that that's why the stigma is here because you know, people who, who are engaged in an industry where it happens a lot and it does because like, you can shift quickly, you know, we can pivot over to the music industry or, or the, you know, the movie stars or the music, you know, the entertainment industry. Um, look at the young lady that, that you remember her name more than I do, the tennis player that just opted to, to pull out of tennis because of her mental health uh, feelings and issues around wanting to get some help and support. I don't remember her name just recently. I, yeah, I can't think of her name either. She's famous now, and I'm not very hip on my female tennis players. Right. But but, but, but that I, kind of thing, that kind of thing, in my opinion, first of all, it takes a lot of courage. Second of all, it sends a message to people that, you know what, if your well-being is as important to you as anything else, then you keep it right there. And if you do, the odds are you will live a happy, joyous, and free life, and you will have all the things you want the way you want, and and we won't have to see people suffer. Look at some of the young people in the sports 
uh, music, movie, and entertainment industry that have taken their lives at such a young age. And even some of these, you know, very, very wealthy people have taken their own lives, you know, from the outside looking in, look what they have. But to your point, you know, the, the ball player was isolating probably because when they went out in public, they'd have to shake hands and be nice and you know, I, I, I can't even speak for him because I don't know what it's like, but I could see where that could be an issue and create some real problems for people. And then when you start to isolate, you know, if you're not feeling yourself, the odds are you're going to anesthetize yourself and you're sitting in a nice hotel and everything's paid for. You know, that that uh, I can remember when I first got sober, I would remove everything in the uh, liquor bar. You know, I just wouldn't want the temptation when I was traveling early on. And then I got to a point where, you know, I had enough recovery and I felt comfortable with it. But there are things that people do that we don't quite understand. And I know you and I were talking earlier about, you know, suicide ideation versus taking one's own life. You know, how, how do we help people that are isolating, that are going through that? We don't know. We don't see. We don't sense. We don't smell. How do you help people? It's a tough one. It is tough, but getting on to that. Well, first of all, CC, one thing CC Sabathia says is how sad baseball doesn't recognize it themselves, which means they probably are well aware of it. They just aren't talking about it at all. Because when they had to have, when the Yankees had to have that press conference, Aaron Boone had to go on live TV and talk to the press. Well, his whole backdrop was Budweiser. Because they sponsor everything for baseball. You know, bear is part of baseball. It's that much part. I mean, we talk about it in songs. When you go to a ballpark, what do you do? You have a pretzel and a bear. And that's great when you're someone like like me who can control that because I don't have the addiction. And CC is very envious. He doesn't want people to stop drinking because he doesn't think it's fair that because he has a problem. He just needs to stop drinking. He's fine when people are drinking around him. He knows he cannot chase that demon any longer. But other people he's very envious of that could have that one bear or the two bear. You had mentioned it once, I think, how you couldn't imagine what is the point of even drinking a bear. Well, Stephen King says that too. He says, I never understood near bear. If you can't drink it to get drunk, what's the point of drinking it? It doesn't, it's not that good doesn't taste that good. And he also couldn't, Stephen King also couldn't stand um, walking past a table, like in a restaurant and seeing a drink half full and left there. He goes, you completely wasted it. What's the point? So that's the addiction. That's the addict part. But onto the suicide versus suicidal that you were talking about. Clearly, I had seen a meme the other day that, showed the difference between suicide and being suicidal. And the problem that goes with those two is when somebody's suicidal, we tend to dismiss them as you'll get, you'll tough your way through it. You know, we give them the words. It doesn't mean we're wrong. Right. That might, but we, or we distance ourselves from them or we label them, we stigmatize them. But the minute they do commit suicide, everybody says, I wish I knew. I wish I saw the signs. I wish they reached out to me. So it can't be one or the other. Yeah, I, I'm i still from the firm belief, similar to us, if we ever get phone calls again in our lifetime on this show, we, you know, we had agreed that sometimes you're going to get pranked. Sometimes somebody's going to call in with a joke. Well, me and you said, let the joke be on them. We're going to take every call serious. I think you have to do that with this. Whether or not the person that's speaking suicidal, you know, having the thoughts or the ideology of it, we have to take them serious and listen to them and guide them in the right direction or get the help for them. And that's what the phone number here is for. They could call us, of course, and we will give them the phone numbers to reach out. Of course, they could always call 1-800-273-8255 is the suicide hotline, and that's 24 hours. And they're not tracing your calls. You got to believe in this system of this. These people are there to help. They're not there to cause more chaos in your life. They'll talk to you. It, this doesn't mean somebody has the, you know, already, you know, attempted. That's when you call 911. 
But this is what you call to get that person help. And they will guide you through it, talk to you for hours. You could text them if you want to be more anonymous to it, but it's it's a good thing. Don't don't assume that there's any shadiness going on with this because I've been reading articles. People could post anything online. I believe in it. So, um, hey, you know, Fred, what was the name of the guest? What was the name of the guest that, you know, talked to a couple of weeks ago with a guy that was a comedian? He talked about this issue. Do you know what I'm yeah, talking Frank, about? Yeah. Frank King. Frank. You know, he mentioned the fact, I can't remember the condition that he said he suffered from that, you know, everything that went into his brain, you know, that he, he's, you know, he would, it would go down this one little funnel first and the, and the funnel would say, you, you know, you, you're not going to be able to handle this. Why don't you right. just go ahead and, you know, so it's like that part of his brain for, for quite a long time just didn't process effectively. Right. I believe and, he and, said, he used to say it, suicide was always on the menu. Correct. Was, is Correct. how he said it. And sometimes, not even on the menu, but it, it would be pre-ordered for him, so to speak, where, you know, I call it a, a, a portal in the brain where the brain hears something. And, and you're, I, look, I call it catastrophic thinking. You know, like when, when I'm in a crowd of 50 people and someone walks up and says, hey, you, and they do it in a way where you hear it, I'm thinking, I must have done something wrong. They must be talking to me. I mean, that's not suicidal thinking, but I call it catastrophic thinking and it's just something for some reason I have, I've always had. And, you know, it, it, it kind of, you know, like when you're driving down the street and you go, I hope a cop doesn't pull me over. Well, why would I even have that thought? But, you know, something there is planted in my brain and it comes up. I don't do it all the time, but you know, it happens sometimes. And he was saying it happened more frequently than he really wanted it to, but once he got it, you know, under a, you know, to a point where he could manage it, things were much, much better for him. Yeah, he does do, I, I follow him on Facebook and stuff. The gentleman does, Frank King does a lot of good things, you know, and Chris says that he suffers from that too, catastrophic thinking. But um, I think it's common. It's one of them things. So it looks like Chris had mentioned that he is in encampment in San Diego right now with a few folks and they are all listening. So... What is, what is, can you explain that to me? What that he means by that? What's encampment? It, well, a homeless encampment, basically. But he, he's not homeless, <laughs> not this week. But you know, Chris is a guy who's actually doing a lot of, um, you know, uh, grassroots outreach in the homeless community. So he's probably in a homeless encampment somewhere. And a homeless encampment would be defined as a group of people that are, you know, set up camp, so to speak. And that's where they've been living yesterday, the day before, maybe weeks and months at a time, because right now the, you know, the, the way most law enforcement works, they're not going to approach and just bundle up somebody's uh, living quarters. Cause technically the ACLU has represented a lot of homeless people, other attorneys have, and then they sue the city. So, uh, you know, going back to your point earlier, you know, if you see someone who's trying to take their own life, you can call 911. But if you see somebody who's resistant to change or, you know, you can literally watch them shoot up heroin there's not a whole lot you can really do. So he's at a homeless encampment, feeding, mentoring, and advocating. That's what he does. And he records his stuff and he, he puts it up on, um, I think on his YouTube, he's putting the channel together. And Chris is a, a good guy. He's, he's all over the place. I mean, he's San Diego, Venice, and uh, he goes up to Riverside. So he's, uh, he's become a um, hopeless helper and doing a very good job of really trying to help people, you know, one person at a time. He's the one that was uh, brought the attention of Oceanside to me about the movement around of people. So he's a good guy. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, thanks for your hard work there, Chris. Is it yeah. Sherm? Chris Sherm? Mm -hmm. Is that how you say it? That's how I you get, say it. When you see that, I get really, that, that really throws me off. When you see the S followed by a CH, That'll blow my mind every time. I never know how to pronounce something that starts with S and then follows with CH. So, but I guess that's going to be it, Scott. I think it was a great discussion as we always do every week. I think we had three, three major areas today. Uh, you know, we're getting better at this. I think, uh, Fred, we should let other people know. I mean, we covered a couple of really difficult topics in 35 minutes and, I, and their topics, by the way, Every single community in this country has experienced and still is experiencing, and everything we've just discussed, unfortunately, is on a trajectory to get worse. 
if we don't manage it more effectively. Yeah. And I think it's going to take a, listen, me and you do what we can. This is what I do. This is my gift to it. And maybe there's going to take a few more of these types of shows to get it out there, to make it more serious and get people talking. And listen, I don't mind talking about this. I don't mind learning from you. I think um, in the next few weeks, we're going to start digging into chapters of your book and we'll discuss, uh, you know, now that I have a copy of the book, because he, of course, sent it to me late after all the governors got it. I got it, you know, but. You know, I have I, pay- look, I, I have my priorities. And by the way, just so you know, I thought I got one out to you early. And, and look, this morning I, I woke up, my laptop was going a little wacko. So I, I, you know, restarted it. Okay. So I want you to know that this condition is not isolated just to you. So, you know, the screen comes back on, it's asking for my username and password. I, I could not think of my username. I knew my password. It's like one, two, three. So I'm frustrated. My wife, what's the matter? I can't find, you know, she's, it's on your computer. I go, I can't get in my computer. I just restart. Why would you restart? I said, because it was dragging or something. Anyway, after about 30 minutes of looking everywhere I could and then going through some old emails, I remembered what my username was and it was user. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. So, you know, I could be entering the, the, the small little terrain of a little bit of uh, some timers, but I think maybe, maybe I'm just t- tired. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. But So maybe so we'll don't, start, don't I'll we'll look see. into your book and we'll start picking that book apart and maybe do a chapter a week and, That'd be great. you know, I'll ask the questions out of it and you just talk about it. It helps promote your book, which is a very good book. I started reading some of it and that's going to be it for ending the stigma. So Goodbye to everyone. Goodbye to you, Scott. See you later, or, Fred. Good luck, or, by the way, t- tomorrow. Let me know how it goes. Text yeah, me. I will. I will let you know. And we will talk to you guys soon, I guess. Next week, next Wednesday, I think. Hey, have a great 4th of July. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. Don't. You don't need to drink at all, technically. I won't be drinking. I'm actually driving to New York. If you look, if you like to party, it's a great weekend for it. But don't get behind the wheel. If you, you know, don't do anything goofy and get behind the wheel of a car and don't like get fireworks. Medication. And be careful of that counterfeit medication that's out there. If you're hearing this, if you're at a party, you're at an event, somebody comes up and goes, "Hey, you got to try one of these." Think really hard. If there's fentanyl in there, it could kill you. Yes, and there's fentanyl all over the United States, all over the world, I would assume. But let's concentrate on our country first. And that's going to be it. So have a safe 4th of July, everyone. Let's do our best to help people be the best versions of ourselves. This is Ending the Stigma with Fred Carroll and Scott H. Silverman. Make sure you go over to Amazon. You could buy Scott's book, The Opioid Epidemic. And you could buy my books, too, there, if you really want to look at books, you know. You know, you can, you can go buy my books. They're not epidemic related, but I could use some money. I but you can probably spell money. the titles of your books. You're having difficulty with mine, but we'll, it, look, it's we'll a, working out. I'm getting better. What is it? It's the journey, not the destination. That's right. I'm getting better at it. Okay, everybody. We'll, t- we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Take care.